Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, hello, willkommen, bienvenue, konnichiwa. It's time for the Armist Inquisition yet again. Episode 154 on Sunday the eight, oh, Sunday the 11th today, 11th of October. I'm Armist Phil. I'm Armist Ben. And I'm Armist Matt. And tonight's guest is um, an esoteric scholar, magical practitioner, and author of The Priestess and Pearls, Rituals for the Journey to the Divine Feminine, George Van Relt. Thanks for Hi. coming. Thank you for having me. Um, we were just talking before about um, Dion Fortune, who's your sort of specialist subject. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was saying, like, I've, I've been doing some bits and bobs of esoteric research over the last few years, and the same sort of handful of names keep cropping up again, and, and Dion Fortune mm-hmm. is one of these. So why don't you tell us a bit about her background and um, what it is about her work that sort of gets her into this esoteric tradition? Sure, um, although I'll, I'll do my best. She's rather a huge figure to try and describe. So she was, you know, sort of the same milieu, a little bit later than Crowley and Rigardi and all the big names. Um, and she started out as one of the first uh, women psychoanalysts in England. Wow. And she trained as a psychoanalyst um, right at the time when the whole young Freud conflict had really come to a head. And they had psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts analysts that they had said that they weren't going to explore occultism anymore and they wanted to keep it scientific and so she quit because she thought you had to study occultism as part of the brain and she started writing books about occult theories of love and marriage and such like um, and ended up founding her own society called the brotherhood and then the society of the inner light um but really, she was just such a prolific writer. I wish I could remember off the top of my head how many books she wrote, but it's in the 30s. And all of them are packed with stuff. But they're also all sort of aimed at the casual occult reader as opposed to texts like Crowley's, which expect you to have, you know, at least a classical education. Dion Fortune was writing for the middle classes and especially for women, which in the 1930s and 40s occult world was quite a big deal yeah it was so was this sort of after or around the same time as madame blavatsky and the theosophical society then so she was post blavatsky but she was actually in the theosophical society right uh while it was run by annie Besan, and she uh headed up what was called the christian mystic lodge of the theosophical society she get got permission to start that um, but she ended up leaving the Theosophical Society because she had issues with the politics of the leadership and started doing her own thing instead. Right, I see. And was it all was it all fiction that she wrote? No, no. She wrote four books. Far, meh, she wrote four famous books of occult fiction, uh, a rather less famous book of occult fiction, uh, some short stories. She also wrote Pot Boilers, which are sort of romantic, non-occult books that are very 30s and very funny. And she wrote uh, non-fiction. She wrote a very famous book called The Mystical Kabbalah um, and a book called Esoteric Philosophy of Love and Marriage and various books on initiation and occultism. Right. And so her work's seen as maybe sort of a good entry to get into this subject, a study of esotericism, would you say? She's sort of a matter of taste. Um, I think she's very good, but she's not terribly popular with occultists these days because she's sort of seen as being a bit vanilla and old-fashioned um, compared to the likes of Crowley or Austin Spare or these kind of transgressive figures. But I do think that she has something of her own to offer. And I know the mystical Kabbalah for the long time, for a very long time, was really the best intro text to the Hermetic Kabbalah. 
Wow, right. I'll have to check that one out then. It's good. It, well, I like it. I know that not everybody agrees with me, but I think that it's a very good book. Is that a common thing in, in esoteric circles, that sort of the more controversial people are, the more popular they tend to get? I mean, that would be a matter of, I don't think, again, everybody would agree with me, but I think that these days especially, but arguably since kind of Crowley's time, people have associated occultism with transgression. So it's all about Satanism and sex and drugs and et cetera. And so somebody who comes along going, oh, actually you can do magic and then stop and make dinner for your kids afterwards. And that's fine. People don't want to hear that, but actually that was the unfortunate whole thing. Right. So sort of marrying sort of regular civilian life with uh, magical practice or ritual magic, do you call it? Very much so. Yeah. Ritual magic, she called it. And in her novels, I mean, they're great because they'll be off in the temple doing the great moon, right? And then they'll get finished and she's like, oh, do you need some tea? And she'll go and make scones (laughs) in the heart. Right. uh, Right. So I can see why maybe the hardcore Crowley fans are uh, maybe a bit turned off by that. Um, but funnily enough, she, her and Crowley had a very interesting relationship. Um, they definitely, there's some evidence that early on he wasn't a big fan of hers, but they definitely held correspondence in his later years. Um, and they seem to have broadly agreed on many kind of theological precepts and such like. Right. So was she English then? Mm-hmm. Right. She was Welsh. She was, um, she was born in, uh, the town that name has completely escaped me, but she was born in Wales um, and her family were from Yorkshire. And then I presume did she move down to London when all this sort of stuff was booming yes. in the early 20th so century? She, she lived in London for a long time. Um, and eventually in her later years, she moved and founded a little occult hostel in Glastonbury. The perfect place. Yeah. Well, she that was before Glastonbury had really become such a new age hotspot and actually she was one of the real uh motivations for that she wrote a book called avalon of the heart which is her sort of esoteric interpretation of the glastonbury myth and such like all right cool i mean we uh, we had our mutual friend rudolph on a couple of months mm. ago was it maybe mm. six weeks ago and like i mean you know we only had an hour and i could have talked to him you know we could have spent an hour on just one aspect of esotericism you know we 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 did a bit on sacred geometry, on music, binaural music, and the history of the tradition, but we only touched very briefly on ritual magic, so I think that would be a good subject to sort of um, drill down a bit into. Um, How's it work? (laughs) (laughs) You know, I knew you were going to ask me this. I was like, okay, I have to come up with a simple explanation of ritual magic. So... People get that, like, going to the theatre has a strong effect on you, right? Nobody would question if you went and saw a really good play, especially if it had something really interesting going on with the visuals or whatever, that you might have a bit of an altered experience and come out going, wow. Um, And similarly with mass and, you know, the the religious rituals where we're more familiar with, like especially Catholic ones, you expected you expect to go and have something shown with some smells and some lights and feel something. So ritual magic sort of takes these ideas and goes, well, we can apply that to whatever we like. So, you know, a lot of people usually work with a deity of some kind, but it's also possible to do it with no deities. But a ritual ritual magic usually involves using corresponding, so that is, you know, uh, colors and smells and sights and symbols and sounds that are related somehow either to the deity you're trying to manifest or the the goal that you wish to bring about whether it's mundane or mystical um and you sort of set up to some degree or another a little play for yourself so you know a very simple ritual can be just involved making a cup of tea and saying a prayer or something like that and of course it blends into sort of everyday rituals Um, And then right at the other end of the scale, you have things like the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn who do big, you know, 10 people rituals where everybody has custom made roles and robes and have memorized uh, long, you know, prose and poetry to to say to each other. Mm. Um, And again, those can, well, they can be very effective. They can also end up a little bit like a pageant or a play. Um, but it's it's a very interesting technology to play with. It's mostly, and I mean, this is actually a Dion Fortune paraphrase, it's about understanding the psychology of 
scent and sound and sight and creating experiences in your own mind and in the world through the manipulation of your surroundings. Wow. I think that sums it up. Yeah, yeah. I think one thing we likened it to when we talked to Rudolph was um, positive affirmations, wasn't it? The uh, Dilbert guy. So that, yeah. like a way of sort of training your subconscious to notice certain things that otherwise would pass you by and that's how you can sort of maybe influence your subconscious to get a reaction in the conscious world. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, I like, I like that as well. That's a little more of a subtle definition than mine was. And I mean, one of the... One of the things that's hard to talk about ritual magic is it can mean so many different things. So I know ritual magic practitioners who never say any words out loud and are entirely about just influencing things very subtly. And I know people who go in for vast speeches. But yes, it tends to be about, I mean, whether I subscribe to the psychological model of magic, I'm not really sure I do. But just using that to be easy, it's about um, influencing your subconscious and your unconscious to produce psychological effects i guess there's there's a whole spectrum of of beliefs you know from from people from sort of maybe a jungian or a psychological bent sort of uh, believing in sort of what i suggested all the way through to i'm going to summon this entity or whatever there's people who are hardcore atheists who do ritual magic and absolutely believe it's just in their brain and I know people who are absolutely devoutly believe that the real presence of ex God or spirit appears in the space before them. Mm. I find myself sort of somewhere sliding around in the middle of the spectrum. I think really that question brings up, you know, interesting other questions about what mind is and what, you know, psychological experience really is and such like. Um, but usually ritual magic practitioners these days tend to keep it mostly psychological. Do you think there's um, there's a level of tuning you'd have to go through in order to uh, sort of increase your reception of this? Because I know you likened it to perhaps theatre or Catholic mass, but if you're just not that into plays or you're not a Catholic, those sorts of things aren't going to chime with you. So I guess there's, there's there must be some level of uh, receptiveness that, that has to be there in order for it to really have any effect, be it psychological or no. Yes, although I'm not sure that I would, I believe it's a natural receptiveness. It definitely has an effect of like upbringing and experiences and such like. You remind, so when Dion Fortune talks about this, she brings up St. Ignatius, who of course was the founder of the Jesuits, but is very popular within uh, especially Christian magic, uh, which is a thing. Um, and he talked about the effectiveness of regular prayer. And his spiritual exercises involve... Um, praying and meditating on scenes from Christ's life, but meditating specifically on the emotions involved. So you're supposed to feel with Christ. But fortune takes this to a magical place and applies the same technique in other ways and says, you know, regular prayer and regular exercise of the imagination, the image-making faculties and emotions teaches you to a place where you can then walk into a temple or sit in front of your altar or just sit down and immediately be in the space or the place. Um, yeah. So it's definitely a practice thing as well. Do you do you think the sort of um, the major religions? Because you mentioned Christian magic's a thing, and of course, transubstantiation is is um, part of the uh, c- canon, I guess, of um, of Catholic faith. But mm-hmm. I don't know how many people would actually, you know, truly believe that's physically going on, even though on paper that's what you're supposed to to think. Do you think maybe some of the major religions, even though the, I would say the, a lot of them are, are based on this sort of mystical, magical sort of foundation, mm-hmm. do you think they've lost touch with that? And it, it was interesting what you said about, uh, about um, practical magic being uh, linked with psychology and, and the fact that, um, uh, da, 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 who was it, Dion, um, was saying about how she wanted to keep the um, occult connected to the science and that therefore there is some scientific basis in the origins of, of this kind of pagan tradition that's remained since since the dawn of it. Um, I think that there's sort of... I wouldn't say that scientific traditions have remained since the dawn of them. I'd rather say that 
when science became a thing, it was deeply entrenched with magic and the sort of how those things came to be separated and defined is in itself a massive subject. So things like mesmerism, right? Some guys in frigging the University of Paris argued and decided that mesmerism didn't count as science. And so it doesn't. But that was literally five people or probably more. But, you know, it was one time thing. Yeah. Um, Fortune, she was really big on the psychoanalysis and the science, but she was also Christian and she was also a really hardcore Christian occultist. So there is a lot of sort of bridging it. And I think that one of the things I like about magic is it really rejects the sort of distinction between religion, mysticism and science and sort of just mm. goes conglomerate them all. Yeah. Um, I, you asked whether uh, magic is sort of separated from religion. And I think the answer will be it really depends where you stand, like physically in space almost, you know, because... There is plenty of religion that's absolutely divorced from magic, but also every religious tradition has magical practitioners working within it today. Absolutely, so. yeah. yeah. In a way, I'd say that modern religion has almost rejected science at some point in its history. Um, you know, Reformation, perhaps, era. Um, there was a, a fight against science, and that, that, yeah, it's interesting that there's... Oh, Christianity, because I think the story in Islam yeah. is very, very different about the distinction between science. Yeah, sorry. I, I can only speak for my own um, understanding, I guess. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, I find it very interesting that there's, that, like you said, there's that, that link has remained and that kind of blend of, of mm. science and, and mysticism is, is still there. And, I, you know, that, that seems important to me as, as a scientist. Mm -hmm. Um. So, yeah. No, I mean, and I, I think one of the really exciting things about about magic is the ways that it, you know, not to be like it expands the boundaries of science, but it sort of does play with the level of what counts as science and what doesn't. And the whole history of sort of psychical research is very interesting with that regard. Um, mm. And that's one of my favorite things about researching the history of this stuff is discovering all these places where it was just one person or one paper, one experiment that stopped something from being magic and made it science or vice versa. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's, yeah. It's so black and white, isn't it? That? <laughs> mm -hmm. But it wasn't, it wasn't at one point. Mm. There's a famous quote, isn't there? That, um, you know, if you had the technology sophisticated enough and, and showed it any to, yeah, uh, any sufficiently ex uh, advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. Do you know who it was? Who was it that? Isaac Asimov. Oh, Asimov. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Asimov. Um, and of course, the same thing's true of religion, and that's where that kind of idea is sort of particularly interesting. Now, the the religious sort of um, feelings, I would say, uh, most of them would be sort of ecstatic or uh, euphoric. You know, I'm thinking of like the, the Easter ceremony in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in, Sepulchre, Sepulchre in Jerusalem. It was like a, almost like a mass hysteria mm -hmm. or euphoria. Is, is that what you're trying to achieve as well? It can it be. Different... It certainly can be. Um, I know that uh, the Gnostic Mass, which is the main rite of the OTO, that's very much sort of the effect of going to one of their pi big public masses is the very euphoric, ecstatic experience afterwards. Um Everyone comes bubbling out the temple going, oh, wow, um, which is very fun. Uh, some lone practice can be like that, but of course there's as many forms of experience as there are practitioners. Um, and especially with the more kind of, I don't like the word dark, but you know, when you're talking about more chthonic deities, then often it's the opposite. And, you know, a lot of ritual work can be about delving caves and darkness and trying to explore what are typically considered negative feelings as well. You, you mentioned the OTO there. That's mm -hmm. the order that Alistair Crowley set up, is that right? Yes, the Ordo Templi Orientis. Well, he didn't set it up. It was actually founded by a man called Theodore Royce, but uh, Crowley sort of popularised it um, and took it over, and it's still going on today. Yeah, I but yeah. What well, tells about it? Tell us about the OTO. Um, I will. I I have a somewhat contemptuous uh, contemptuous. That's the wrong word. A tempestuous relationship <laughs> with the OTO. Oh. Um, but the, yes, they um, they they perform the Gnostic Mass, uh, which is uh, Crowley's attempt to write a sort of magical occult mass that everybody could understand. It's very sort of sexual nature worship 
adoring the phallus and adoring the cateus type thing. Um, not to everybody's taste. It can be very good when well done. I've also seen it look absolutely absurd. Um, and they also run initiations, um, which, you know, supposedly uh, take you through spiritual journeys and spark new understandings and awarenesses, which, again, can work but aren't guaranteed to work. Right. Uh, one of the things I was going to ask you about, because you're very open about mm-hmm. being a magic magical practitioner, and one of the things I wanted to ask was, it, is there still a stigma attached to that? And if so, uh, can you pin a lot of that on maybe Alistair Crowley himself? So, I mean, it kind of, whether there's a stigma on it sort of depends on what worlds you tread. I really think these days there's much less stigma. I mean, especially with the sort of popularization of witchcraft in just, you know, sort of really, really contemporary culture, really saying you're a witch nowadays, nobody cares. And so I tend to just say I'm a witch if people ask who I don't think know the distinction. Um, Within the kind of academic world, it can be very interesting because generally people who are historians of occultism are practitioners, but they don't tell anybody that they're practitioners because that's sort of seen as a... um, conflict of interests but I did my first degree in theology and I was taught by priests so I kind of never saw it being a conflict of interest um and so far it hasn't really caused me any major problems I I think I've managed to walk that line but see in another 10 years whether I've managed it still (laughs) that's interesting so you started in theology that was your route was that your route into (laughs) esotericism Yeah, I I did my undergrad degree in in Christian theology at a Presbyterian seminary in St. Andrews, of all places. (laughs) So what was was the sort of bridge? What was was it that made you go into esotericism? Can you put it down to a certain thing? I can. Um, It's a poster, one single poster. Um, I was finishing my degree and I was like, what the hell am I going to do next? And I saw this one poster with, I don't know if you've seen that picture of the they always have it for sort of hermetic things, and it's a guy sticking his head out of the, the ether. It's a medieval woodcut I'm describing terribly. Um, but it was advertising an MA course in esotericism. I was like, wow, that sounds fun. Um, and like six months later, there I was. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, uh, so how did not this, the usual path. How do you start a course? Because we were talking to Rudolph about this. There's so many different subjects, whether it's mm. tarot or Kabbalah or Gematria or and it just goes on and on and on. How do you teach this at least a terrorism course? Um, that course is very interesting. So I did it. I did the Amsterdam course, which is sort of still the big, um, I don't know what you'd call it, centre for academic study of esotericism. So they they teach a sort of one course on medieval alchemy and the sort of history of esotericism up until the Enlightenment and a little bit after that. And then they teach one course that's sort of the history of modern magic. Um, That particular course is taught very much from a historical perspective. So they don't really go into Kabbalah as in like what it is and what its meanings are as much as talk about the history and the ways it changed from, you know, early Jewish culture through the various medieval commentators and such like. Right. So Um, more of a history of esotericism. Well, it's a religious studies course. So very much so. Um, Yeah. Um, you were talking um, you, about, well, I was reading about your book about mm. the divine feminine. And mm. this is a concept that keeps sort of keeps cropping up in certain books that I'm reading. What's your, mm. what's your thoughts on the divine feminine, what it is? And <laughs> That's, a, again, a massive question. Um, so I like divine feminine over goddess because um, I think... God and more than more than God, goddess brings up quite a specific image in people's mind, and it brings up a certain kind of pagan worship. Whereas I see the divine feminine as a bit more of a ephemeral concept, um, and I like to theologize endlessly. So I think it's a much better concept to sort of think about like that. Um, and to me, it just is very obvious that if there's anything, which I believe there is, that can be called divinity, then it must have dual aspects of active and passive activity and passivity the same way the whole world does. Um, and we call those in the occult world, uh, masculine and feminine. 
again, I like the divine feminine because it's not saying this thing is, is female or woman in any meaningful way. It's trying to talk about the qualities that it possesses. Um, <clears throat> but in, in my, my book, in the, the book that I wrote, those were inspired by me actually joining the OTO and finding that it seemed entirely focused on a divine masculine, which right. I was like, well, what's the point? I could have been Christian. So that was sort of my attempt to do what they were doing, you know, writing rituals and initiations, but that wouldn't end up at this sort of ephemeral divine masculine that I had no interest in, but that would take it to what I thought was far more interesting, which was the hidden divine feminine, which sort of lurks behind it, which you see in occult texts. It's not like I made it up, you know, um, it's very, it's very obviously there, but occultism has a sort of tricky history with uh, gender and sexuality. And so it often is sort of left out and minimized. Behind oh. every great man, as they say. <laughs> oh, no, you can't say that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> To the side, you should say, not behind. Inside. <laughs> but I, I mean, mean it's, <laughs> it's a fairly, it's a relatively modern, in anthropological terms, it's mm. it's a fairly modern development, this masculinity being brought forward. Because if you think of sort of, you know, pagan, I'm thinking of the, is it uh, Tuatha Danan in Celtic pagan mm. mythology, prehistory, and then through to the classical period, you've got he Hera and... Oh, I mean, ISIS the, and... Absolutely, and when you look, I mean, it's it's known now, of course, that the great goddess theory that we were all once, you know, goddess worshippers isn't true, but we definitely did worship goddesses alongside gods. Mm. Um, and when you kind of look at the history, what happened when Catholicism took over was the goddess became the Virgin Mary um, and Sophia, and there's lots of divine feminine within Catholicism. But one of the main things that was stripped out, you know, when Luther started doing his thing was divine femininity. Um, and so you really see that in post um, Protestant, Protestant and post Protestant countries. Um, and so that's sort of what I'm it responding seems, to. It seems sort of a natural, um, well, not necessarily natural, but a, 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 a reaction to monotheism. Because if you're, if you're pagan and you have many gods, you can have. 50 male gods and 50 female gods but if suddenly if you go to monotheism you have to either make a choice it has to have a gen it has to have a gender or a sex or or be neither doesn't it and of course you know i i know a lot of people will or do claim that the christian god isn't gendered and of course yahweh originally has uh both masculine and feminine aspects in them and if you go back to um you know some there's some kind of uh, biblical commentary talks about the fact that, of course, it's it's uh, the Godhead is referred to as they and them, not as he. Um, so there are clear signs uh, that there was a sort of dual aspect to the early Hebrew Godhead. But, of course, everybody sort of assumes that the Christian God is Sky Daddy. Um, and, Com yeah. Compounded just... with Jesus as well. Yeah. Some white guy with a beard sitting <laughs> on a cloud. Uh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, do, you, do you think it reflected like society at the time and and i i, I, I don't know i wasn't there but was that the sort of rise of, of patriarchy and and the kind of the male well and that's what the you know the great um goddess cult people who were really into that which kind of lasted from um the 19, 1800s, late 1800s, right until like the 60s, everyone was like, yes, you know, we had this prehistoric goddess and then the patriarchy came and it smashed the goddess and now we just have Christianity. It didn't happen quite like that. It was a far more complex and, you know, ongoing change. I don't, I think it's kind of problematic to, I mean, I'm sure, obviously there's a very, there's a huge relationship between patriarchy and Christianity, but I think saying, oh, the loss of the goddess was entirely from this thing called patriarchy is sort of projecting causation where I don't think it's quite clear which way that happened and how. Yeah, more of a slower societal change, but it's it's more about, I was thinking um, that God is created in man's own image mm -hmm. rather than classically the other way around. Well, of course, originally the uh, God created Lilith and Adam. 
Um, and then Adam didn't like Lilith very much, or rather Lilith didn't like being under Adam. So then God created Eve out of a rib so that he could have a, you know, an inferior woman, which is a myth that comes up a lot in occult circles, which I think, you know, is because a lot of women are looking for an alternative to the Christian creation myth. Mm. Um, I wonder if, if some of it maybe comes, goes back to literally to the dawn of agriculture, because if you think of, of hunter-gatherers who were uh, nom- nomadic, and then eventually we, once we develop agriculture, that sort of promotes a sedentary um, life where, where you start making villages, and all of a sudden the concept of property is uh, evolves. You know, if you go to a tribe in Papua New Guinea or the Congo, they uh, an uncontacted tribe they don't have any concept of the word of property a tool is just a tool it's not no one owns it yes but i would be careful there because of course the uncontacted tribes very few we have left are often no more far worse in their patriarchy than than we are really um, so that's quite and again that i mean i don't like to project onto people but yeah it's it's kind of it's sort of <sighs> It's all pseudo history. We can't know. So we like to make ideas. And I'm sure that the rise of um, agrarian societies really impacted the patriarchy. But the extent to which that got rid of the goddess is very questionable because, Mm. of course, you have grain goddesses and fertility goddesses going on and on far after that. Yeah. Um, It's very clear. I mean, throughout the world, there are myths of goddesses uh, being kind of kicked out of their original position. Okay. So things like. Oh, I can't, Amarat, uh, Amaratus, I can't pronounce her name. Amaratusu, I probably butchered that, who is the Japanese goddess, um, and a Nana as well, and a Reshka girl. These are all myths of, of ancient superior goddesses who have been thrown out by the sky god and are now uh, lesser, which suggests that at one point there were societies that had a firmly just a goddess. Um, however, there's absolutely no historical evidence that means we can actually say when that happened or why or or anything yeah it'd be too too neat and tidy to sort of tie it to you know the and people institution like it too, of marriage and, and, all and it was very popular for a long time to tie it all up in a parcel and say here this is what happened but historians realize now that it's just too complicated to try and, and do that with it yeah uh, you I mean, mean, there's um, there's a strong female presence in in the christian faith in in mary I guess. And I've not read any of the Gnostic Gospels. I know Phil will be uh, all over those, but <laughs> but I think that's a, probably the closest thing that, that Christianity has to a, a sort of female Divine deity. feminine, yeah. Hmm. And Mary's very interesting because, of course, she's an amalgamation of various pagan goddesses. So she has the lunar crescent like Isis did and Hathor, um, and she takes on all of these different goddess attributes and often varying depending on where she is because they already had a goddess cult and they went okay well now call her something slightly different and you can keep worshipping her um which is what happens and i mean there's there's fascinating things this is a bit of a side note but of course there's things like the the pilgrimage badges we have which are phalluses supporting a you know a little vagina on a on a beer and that's a pilgrimage badge. That's because somebody went on a Christian pilgrimage somewhere and the sign of that city is this little weird sexual scene. And these are sort of evidence of the mingling of pre-Christian fertility rites with the Christian that was contem- Christianity that was contemporary then. And people didn't seem to have any issue with just sliding the two together and saying, cool, that weird sex rite we do in the fields, now we do that, but we do it to... Mary instead of the goddess we had before. Fine. Yeah, pretty and much. Con- a- ancient Rome were, were famous for sort of adapting their the religious mm-hmm. calendar when the conversion happened, weren't they? And of course, Roman the Romans were the ones who spread Catholicism far and wide, or Christianity as it were then. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Lilith before. Now she's a bad guy, isn't she? Depends well. who you ask, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> What's the uh, what's the sort of mythology behind Lilith? Well, we know. Does is there like a, a different mythology other than the Adam and the Genesis story? Well, so she she's uh, and again, I'm not an expert in ancient Hebrew myths, but um, so she appears in uh, what's the word? Not in the original Talmud, but in um, some of the myths that surround it. Um, 
And she, you know, was just this demoness um, until, you know, and I just researched the history of her. And now you're asking me, I'm like, blank. But basically, when it got to about the 18th, 19th century and women were, you know, becoming a little bit more free, but also men were becoming more and more obsessed with monstrous femininity because women were becoming more free. So they're scary. Um, and she became this really popular figure. And in the 19th century, there's a whole host of novels and books and poems. And, you know, Rosati has a very famous painting called Lilith. Um, she sort of captured the imagination as this, you know, demon woman, but in a, in a negative sense. Um, and then round about the time women, some women began to get the vote, which was 1912, 1918. I can't remember which was the first, um, a shift happens in the literature and she starts to be portrayed increasingly as a positive figure, or at least she's not sort of damned or killed at the end. Um, and Dion Fortune, actually, her last book, Moon Magic, the main character is called Lilith Le Fay. And she is a, she's a retelling of the Lilith myth in a very positive light uh, as a sort of female occult adept. Le Fay um, from Mor- Morgan. So in the sea priestess, she's called Morgan Le Fay. And Vivian Morgan Le Fay, and she's supposed to be the reincarnation of Morgan Le Fay. Mm. And then in the next book, she decides she's changed her name to Lilith, um, but it's the same character, um, sort of. It's, it's slightly odd. Um, and nowadays, of course, Lilith is is often well. I mean, she's usually viewed as demonic, but many many women practitioners, in particular, work with her and see her as a sort of emancipatory patron demoness deity type thing. Yeah, there's a lot of Arthurian mythology running through esotericism, isn't there? Yes, very much so. I mean, that's sort of, I mean, Fortune saw, and I think a lot of other people kind of saw that as the foundational sort of uh, non-Christian Western myth. So when they're searching for a sort of pagan origin for their stuff, it's all in the Arthurian. Even though that's like sort of based on the Holy Grail, like the, the, the Christian... Well. Of course, it, it's sort of based on the Holy Grail, but it's also sort of based on Caridon's cauldron, um, which is a Gaelic, a Celtic uh, myth about, well, it's about the Holy Grail. There's the lines between Christianity and paganism and occultism don't really exist. <laughs> so a lot of occult stuff borrows really, really directly from Christian mythology and Christian theology and it's why it was one of my favorite things when people are like, I don't like Christianity, but I'm a cultist. And I'm like, I can trace back anything you're doing to a Christian root at some point. <laughs> um, and of course, most of those Christian things then before that had come from paganism. So it's very um, back and forth. I think the thing about the Arthurian mythos that really captured, particularly sort of 19th and 20th century, so the, the occultists we know, is the nationalism of it. You know, they were all very concerned with, which now, of course, is very unfashionable, so we don't really talk about it. But in the 19th, 20th century, they were very concerned with nationhood and remaining strong and steady and, you know, the empires falling and such like. And so that becomes a really potent symbol, which, of course, Dion Fortune used uh, to kind of protect and rally England behind. But it was also popular with the Nazis who went looking for the Holy Grail itself. Um, so it had all sorts of political implications, that story. Wow, yeah, it's, you've got to sort of get it, get in the heads of the, the authors at the time and, and view things in the historical context, don't you, to get the full yeah. picture. I guess this is what your, your PhD is like, having to try and get in her head. Do you feel like you'd know her? Is she, how mysterious a figure is she? Well, so the funny, the fun and funny thing about Dion Fortune is there are no personal papers of hers at all. Uh, when she died, her followers claimed that she asked all of her papers and library to be burnt, and they were. So there is nothing except from her published books and some small bits and bobs of correspondence that have floated around, um, most of which have now been published. So in that sense, it's very hard to get a genuine sense of what she was like, because unlike Crowley, we don't have years upon years of magical diaries. Um, But at the same time, she writes in a very straightforward way. And I think it's quite clear that, especially in her novels, she's sort of writing out things that she feels and thinks. Um, 
I, I, I like to think I would know her. I, I feel like I know her pretty well, but, you know, there's a good chance I'm entirely misled and have no idea about this person. Who knows? Such a difference between that era and today where you can literally just turn on a computer and waffle into a webcam for several hours at a time. And uh, it's so hot. It must be so difficult to... Um, to string things together from from that period when you've you know very little evidence to go off. They mostly have uh, you know the usual thing is correspondence. Um, she also did correspondence courses, which was was rather fun. So she ran courses where people could you know apply and write, and then she would send them out questions and study material, and they were expected to send back in essays and meditations wow. they'd done. Um, and if they passed, they'd be invited down to her occult house center in london to be like further trained and such like so that was sort of you know one of the first mail order occultism classes that <laughs> there was was she, was she as popular in her time or has she got more popular as, as it's gone on do you think well so one of the you know infamous things about crowley is of course he was broke his whole life um and he ended up rather lonely in his final years dion fortune managed to have a house in Bayswater in central London um, and to buy a property in Glastonbury. Um, and she ran a successful society. She published some of her own books. They didn't have huge circulation, but for our court books, they had reasonable circulation. Um, but now she's largely dropped out of the picture. And I think that's a combination of her being less exciting and sort of old fashioned. She also espouses, you know, political and sexual views that aren't, it considered okay these days oh. what's funny is of course crowley also does that but nobody pays any attention to him but suddenly when she's saying these things everybody's like how dare she right. um, what sort of what sort of political and sexual views well in i mean the famous one that people get arsy about is any esoteric philosophy of love and marriage she, she has a small chapter on homosexuality and she describes it as an illness and i've had people get very angry at me until I've pointed out that homosexuality was actually illegal in the 20s when this book was written mm -hmm. and that Oscar Wilde had been, you know, had the whole Oscar Wilde trial had happened less than 10 years before this book was written. Right. So she couldn't really say anything else. She could have not said anything. But actually, on further exploration in other of her books, she talks about the various crushes women have had on her and the fact that this one woman was so insane with desire for her that she chases her around the kitchen with a knife. Um, she regularly talks about being mistaken for a man and getting invited to join men's clubs and having to tell them that she's a woman and gets accused of seducing men's wives and all these kind of things <laughs> that paint a more subtle picture. And I think it's far more likely that she was actually sort of going, by the way, I'm not gay. Look, I'm not gay. I am. Look, I wrote it here. Um, she, she expresses racist views in her books. Um, which I'm not going to defend, but I will say that, of course, Crowley also expresses racist views, I think, far worse than hers. Mm. And people rarely go, oh, we can't look at his work because he said this word. Right. Um, but somehow with Dion Fortune, she doesn't get the same amount of forgiveness. Um, I actually think she had quite a subtle and interesting view on race and nationality and things for her time. And she wrote one of her pot boilers is about a mixed race marriage. It's, very, it's about a very sympathetic portrait of the difficulties of that. And again, people don't seem to notice that. They just go, well, she says Indians can't do British occultism. And I'm like, well, yes, but there are political contexts behind the, these kinds of statements, um, which gets into, you know, I'm, I'm never, I'm not going to be an apologeticist, but I think it's very, it's very important that we understand the context in which occult texts are written in order mm. to actually understand what people are trying to say. Um, yeah, getting the taking in the historical context, like we talked about before, isn't it? You know, these people are living in a different time, and there's a different social attitude. So, you know, probably less developed. I will say, developed. compared to many of the men of the period who espouse similar views, I've never seen any of them be treated or dismissed in the way she is. Um, so that, to me, just strikes a sort of interestingly sexist tone that she's the woman who was forgotten by modern occultism. Um, it's very interesting to me. Did you get a feeling for her political views? Um, 
That's sort of more tricky. Um, she's very, she, you know, she lives through the First and Second World Wars. Um, she worked for the Land Army in the First World War. Um, in the Second World War, she did, she arranged weekly meditations so that everybody would meditate on Britain doing well in the war, basically. Um, and they would all get together at the same time and she'd give a meditation. And they're, they're very uh, based on Arthurian stuff. So they're all about, you know, bringing the strength of the grail and Christianity and everybody was getting together or separately in their houses and thinking really hard. Um, and she did that right through the war. She also stayed in London through the whole blitz, which is pretty impressive in of itself so that she could do this work. Um, other than that, it's not really clear. She, she was anti Indian independence in a big way. Um, early on, at least it's not clear how she felt about that later on. Um, and again, there's, there's complexities there with the Theosophical Society, and it seems that her main issues were actually about the way the Theosophical Society was dealing with that rather than the issue per se. Um, right. she, she had a run-in with a, a man called B.P. Wadia, who is actually a, quite a famous Indian socialist, um, an independ- pro-independence person, but who also seemed to have been running an occult cult in London for some time that um, she claimed was was vaguely abusive and using mesmerism for you know, unpleasant ends and such like. Okay. Um, and she never really got over that, I don't think. And did, she, did she live to see India's independence? When did she pass away? She passed, uh, she didn't live to see the end of the Second World War. She passed in 45. Oh, wow. Uh, what, how old was she? Really good Roughly, yeah, I don't, to <laughs> I the can't nearest the year, he'll do. I remember she was born. She was, she was in her 40s. She was in her 40s. Her 40s? Um, so young. So she died very young. She, she, the story is that she went to get a, her tooth looked at by a friend who was a dentist who informed her she had leukemia and she died two weeks later. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So... Which, of course, is the irony because Crowley lived forever despite his ridiculous lifestyle and fortune who'd been a vegetarian and very health conscious um, died very young. Didn't, it, didn't Crowley famously own a, a mansion on the banks of Loch Ness that Jimmy Page ended up buying? Well, skin, yeah, yeah, he did. Right. But he, by, he wasn't there in the end. He spent his last days in, a, in rooms at a, a pub, I think, although somebody will tell me that I'm terribly wrong. Um, <laughs> Yeah, he didn't. He he didn't end up having much property by the time he died. Um, but Dion Fortune, I believe, still had the house in Bayswater and uh, a commune in, in Glastonbury when she passed. Did she have any family? She married uh, someone called Dr. Penry Evans, and they got separated. Which again, all her biographers are always like, "Oh, she henpecked him, and the poor man had to leave." <laughs> <laughs> of course. God. Um, I'm kind of of the opinion that he, he clearly didn't like how strong-willed she was, but um, that's sort of his problem. Um, he, he, they separated and he left um, after a few years of marriage and then they actually got a divorce, which was relatively uncommon at that time, so that he could remarry again. Um, she didn't marry again, but she did take on other uh, magical partners. But she didn't have children, and she was one of the early proponents of um, of contraceptive methods. Is that what I was trying to say. Um, and she talks about contraception in her books, which is actually insane for the 1930s. Mm, yeah. Um, she talks about the ministrations of Malthus. And, of course, Malthus was a famous, um, well, he was sort of a eugenicist, but what she was talking about was his contraception methods. Bit of a trailblazer, then. Yeah, she was, I mean, in, in her book, she has women explicitly talking about choosing not to have children so that they can pursue magic for the, with their lives, which I really just, nobody else was saying anything like that in that period. No, you've got to think back in the 1920s and whatnot, you know, the, uh, the woman's place was, what did you say, Ben? Every good man needs a woman behind her. And, uh, no, yeah, something like that. Well, uh, behind every great man is a great uh, woman. I <laughs> great mean... Uh, woman. <laughs> Very few f- uh, women at the time would have sort of been financially um, independent at that time and running yeah. a business, uh, being a successful author. That was author. a big thing, yeah. 
And especially someone, um, I mean, and she was sort of, she clearly her family had some money, but she was middle class. And that was, that was a thing because really it was only upper class ladies who ever had enough money to, you know, wallow about. Um, and the other interesting thing, of course, is that someone like Crowley utilized women mainly as sort of tools and had a lot of children and believed that his female partners having children was sort of a magical act in itself. And the women never stayed around for terribly long. Whereas Dion Fortune sort of thought, well, no, I care about the women. So actually, you know, having, yes, let's all go do sexual magic, but let's maybe not have children out of wedlock and end up, you know, in various states. Um, so quite a traditionalist in some ways and, and not in others then, you would say, maybe. Yeah, very much so. Um, in some ways, she was super, super traditional. And then she'll come out with something that's just like, Wow. She, she actually speaks about this, and I mean, this is something that has meant a lot to me in my, my practice, that Crowley is all about revolution, right? Tear everything down, just tear it all down, everything. Which is nice if you're a sort of, you know, aspiring upper-class man. But people have to live, and Fortune talked a lot about evolution, and she's like, revolution's all nice, but it doesn't necessarily get us anywhere. Slow evolution, you know, combining tradition and she always talks about nodding, uh, curtsying to Mrs. Grundy, you know, accepting what society is going to say. And instead of going, I'm going to be a rebel against society, I don't care if they make a pariah of me. She talks about how to do magic without becoming a pariah and how to change things in the world more that way, she sees, because you're not separating yourself and being this satanic outlier. You can actually turn up to the dinner party and, and introduce other people to occultism and such like. Sure, so trying to make it sort of more socially acceptable for the time. Mm -hmm. Very much. My my um my MA thesis was called Tea Scones and Socially Acceptable Sex Magic. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's sex magic? What's the what's the oh. definition there? Between uh, sort of ritual magic. What where's the sex come in? Is it before well, or after? So that, that's a good question. So that's the kind of issue. So Crowley believed Sex magic was coital magic, right? Orgasmic magic. So you think about the thing while you're having the sex. And then when you come, you think about the thing even more. And that sends it either out or in, depending on where you're thinking about it, into your subconscious to do the thing. And people who do sort of chaos magic and sigil charging these days, that's the theory behind that. You use the orgasm as the altered state to achieve. Like a supercharge. Yeah. Right. Dion Fortune didn't do that. She believed that orgasm earthed, earthed or earthed the forces, that's what I'm trying to say, uh, that you use for magic. So she did sexual magic, not sex magic. So it was all about sort of raising the polarity. So getting as much erotic energy between yourself and another person or just by yourself as you possibly can until you're like filled with horniness, essentially. And then instead of using that to have an orgasm, you actually use that to do the magic. Um, and she believed that magic properly worked would take away the ability to have sex. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's it's two different ways of two completely different approaches to sexual magic, both of which have sort of historical um, predecessors. Usually today when people talk about sex magic, they mean Crowley's type. But a lot Fortune sort of believed all magic was sexual magic to a degree um, because she believed that the same sort of erotic forces that are part of sexuality are actually what drives magical experiences. Do you think she was maybe interested by some Far Eastern mysticism and Tantra and things like that? She definitely was uh, familiar with Tantra through uh, Sir John Woodruff or Arthur Avalon, who wrote The Serpent Power, and that was the first translated or popularly available translated Tantric text. Um, and she does talk a little bit about Tantra in, her, in some of her books. So, yeah, she definitely had been influenced by that. Um, so I, it's, I think it's Madame Blavatsky. Didn't she famously go to the East and didn't return for several years or whatever and then came so back and, claimed, with this she revelation? Claimed, she claimed she went to Tibet and was taught by the masters, although whether she ever did is, you know, <laughs> sort of questionable. Some people believe she did. Some people think she's a, a total fraud. Really? So well, she's... she was she was dis she was proven to be a fraud, very famously. Um, I don't but... know this story. 
I'm not the person to be telling the story. I can't, I'm not sure I remember the details of it, but I know it. she was under intense scrutiny for various things. And she had claimed that she could materialize letters from the Mahatmas who were her, her Tibetan masters. And she was materializing these letters. And that specific thing was proven to be a fraud because of course right. it was. And people used that to totally, you know, say that everything she'd done was fraudulent. I've, I've, a friend of mine actually did a very interesting academic study about her sources um, in ISIS and Veiled and things. And he suggests that what she actually had was a photographic memory because she just quotes these huge passages of books and texts that she claimed, oh, just came to her, so it must be true. And actually what it seems is that she just had this insanely amazing photographic memory and she just remembered all these things and was able to regurgitate them. Wow. Tell you if I if I could choose one superpower, that'd be near the top of the list, I think. Photographic so memory. <laughs> yeah. Crikey. That's stuff I've forgotten. <laughs> uh, anyway, we're we're rocking up on time, uh, Georgia. What have you what have you got planned at the, what are you doing at the moment? What have you got planned for the future? Um, finish the PhD. How long That's have you got to get for, go for that? Um it hopefully, fingers crossed, will be done by March, so that's exciting and also terrifying. Um, <laughs> my my next book, which is called Approaching Babylon, Essays for the Abyss, is is imminently going to be published. So that's very Ooh. exciting. Cool. Yes. We didn't even talk uh, about Babylon. <sighs> no. <laughs> Just haven't got enough time, have we? <laughs> so no, are you going to go into teaching, do you think, after the PhD? Or? Uh, that was sort of originally the plan. Um, I'm not sure anymore. Uh, it's it's kind of, it's difficult making a career within occultism strictly. And I'm not sure I'd, I want to be the type who's selling spells and such like. Um, so to be seen is sort of where I'm at with that right now. Yeah. Um, I probably will end up teaching in some capacity while trying to write and do my own weird occult things at the same time. Brilliant. Well, I look for you have to um, let us know when the book's coming out, well, and um, we'll we'll uh, say thanks. Thanks for coming and talk to, talking to us. I think it's been very informative. You. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Having... Yeah, best Thank of luck. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Best of luck with the PhD, and um, yeah, keep in touch, and we'll we'll uh, follow your progress with great interest. <laughs> okay, Georgia, thanks a lot. We'll uh, we'll catch you in a minute. So stay on the line for us a minute. <laughs> right, we're back. The dwarf, the cripple, and the mother of madness. I saw a little chat with George Van Ralt. I thought that was mega interesting. Yes. Mm-hmm. Look forward to the uh, the new book coming out. Ba- yep. Babylon. Babylon. What was it called? I can't remember. I don't. Maybe it doesn't have a title. It's not out yet. Uh, the other, the the first book was um, about the divine feminine. I can't remember what that was called either. You've, oh, you've we'll stumped me now. You stumped me now. You made me sorry. I've, I've taken that piece Shuff- of paper away. Shuffle your papers. <laughs> <laughs> the day to day brass eye. Yeah. Oh, we'll fuck. put it in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, good point. Yes, we'll put all the stuff, all the relevant stuff, in the show notes. Yeah, you can get a book on Amazon. Yeah. Get the old paperback on Amazon. I'm sure, if you're you into... get it in Borders, <laughs> probably. Borders. Is that a joke? That doesn't no. exist. It doesn't Bo- exist here. Borders. I'm pretty sure that I'm willing to put money on the fact there's a Borders somewhere in the in the world open today. But... Cannot be a bookshop, but you know. Yeah, I'm not sure how much money. I'm not going to take that bet. So right. There okay. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> housekeeping 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 I've been coming to terms with the fact that I'm a Marxist yes housekeeping we need housekeeping. iTunes reviews we need to subscribe to the YouTube channel housekeeping and uh, email us, get in contact, send us clips, news stories, videos, become a producer, like the fine people who I'll be reading out shortly, Today. shortly. 
Um, yeah. How do you become a producer, Ben? Uh, give us some money. <laughs> do all those things I just said. But if you do have money, yeah, I mean... Toss a coin to your witcher. Cough one up. <laughs> I think you're hitting, hitting the point, Phil, that... Uh, uh, it really bothers me uh, 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 because I, I believe I have an issue in this respect. It's that little, that little, uh, uh, little burp at the end gets me every Ooh. time. Uh, I, yeah, cough up a coin in the style of Andrew Shatkin. I have uh, another communique from Tamborista 2020. Ooh. Okay. Um, yes, I don't know if you heard about that um, story about that Catholic priest in the States who got caught filming himself on the altar having sex with two dominatrixes. Dominatrices? Well, you know, might as well. If you got the keys to the castle. Wait, if they were dominatrices, could he argue that they were they were having sex with him, and therefore wriggle out of it, as it were? Uh... Yeah. Probably not. Devil's advocate. Hoo-ah! <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, um, uh, here's the message. That's the great thing about starting a religion. Put some oomph in your game. At the pub or club, you can ditch your first name of Brandon and impress a girl with, Hello, lovely, Ooh. I'm Comatan. Started my own religion, I did. Fancy a cosmic snog? What woman <laughs> says no to that? Wow. Yeah, so, uh, and not not content... He carries on with this diatribe. Yep, Rob from the Rubes. Get some new robes, set up a hierarchy of who gets to sleep with dear leader. Then one minute you come by yoing round the campfire, the next you're the human s'mores as the ATF torches your wake or wacko compound. If religion is the opiate of the masses, then everyone is now full of shit from opiate-induced constipation. And I agree with Jack Nicholson's joker that this town needs an enema. But since the net has made the world one big global village, he's got the whole world in his hands and he's bending it over to administer said deconstipation apparatus. He being Brig Brother, who's now got us all covered in shit and we know he's the king because he's the only one who hasn't got shit all over him. Help, help, I'm being repressed, bloody peasant. Whoa, okay, touch the nerve. <laughs> we opened a can of worms there, did we? Yeah, a bit of a... I hope, he's, I hope you're all right, Tamborista. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, yeah. tell you what, though. Gosh. If I was still in my, uh, uh, how shall I term this, rutting days. No, I won't say it like that. If I was, you know, going out clubbing as a youth, <laughs> donning donning robes and asking girls if they fancy the cosmic snog would definitely be on my list of things to definitely do on a weekend and definitely not be successful. It's called peacocking, isn't it? He, it's got a name now. Everyone pigeonholes everything, and it's all to do with birds. <laughs> yeah. yeah, making basically dressing up like an idiot um, is called peacocking. So you attract girls to you, basically, oh, to talk. To Se- you. Secrets out. <laughs> um, we've got some birthday shout-outs. Um, two former guests, Bolt Upright. Had his birthday hey. on Wednesday. 21. 21 again. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, online chemistry tutor, Steve, it's his birthday today. So happy OCT. birthday. Sorry? Uh, OCT, happy birthday. Yeah. All right. One final piece of housekeeping. Uh, I mentioned the other week that I did a guest spot on Never a Straight Answer oh, yeah. podcast. Oh, yeah. So that yeah. Is, that's gone live today. So... I shall put a, a link in the description if you want to hear us talk about secret societies and the Knights Templar and Freemasons and all that palaver. I'll so put it on my list. Yep, so check that out. Uh, the, the local, they're from Manchester. You know what I mean? Not that local. Won't be local after Monday. Oh, and, you me. know, all well, the shutters come down. Yeah, I know. You can't leave your street. Take a break. Yep. Ooh. Okay, then. So, I'll thank the producers for episode 154. We have Just Quidanta, Night Ninja, Nicholas, Tamborista 2020, Diogenes of Sinope, Gav Scott, Gizbane, Arge, Jonathan Mitchell, and Fog City Midge. Thank you. You are so amazing. Your love. They are. Yeah. So amazing in their love. I 
I've been coming to terms with the fact that I'm a Marxist. The dwarf, the carrot, the grape, the cunt, the cripple, and the mother of VCs from hell. I think you're hitting, hitting the point, Phil. <laughs> Thanks for another week. We've had fucking tons of stuff sent us this week. Uh, um, I must have had thir- oh. 30 video clips sent me. Lots of weird avant-garde stuff. I've not just not been able to get through it all. But thanks. I'll, I'll try. Keep it up. Go on, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm just, I'm just not with it tonight. <sighs> COVID-19 news. Put on your fucking muzzle if you go to the shop. The magic vaccine. A big fat shot in the ass from hell. Oh! <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, super painful. Like a judgment day and terminating. More, like... More lives this year than any other year for the past hundred years. Two million people have to die. This is such a crock of shit. This is Sonny Pickering! Who the fuck's that? Yeah, me! Yeah, it's, I've, got, I've got quite a bit, to be honest. Quite a bit of COVID news this week. Um, it came up in the presidential debates, you know. Uh, sorry, the VP debate, which was what this did? week. Um, it's this subject of vaccine hesitancy, which is rearing. I thought um, the main thing that came up in the VP debates was the fly. Yeah, oh, yes. uh, we're doing COVID news, though. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Did the fly not have COVID? It's a vector. <coughs> Is it? Is the fly a vector? It could be, I don't know. I'm going to say yeah, because... It's a pretty big one. <laughs> uh, no, uh, vaccine hesitancy. Yes, it's an increasing problem, particularly in the US and um, Kamala Harris. I don't think she helped matters uh, in this <laughs> clip. say... For life to get back to normal, Dr. Anthony Fauci and other experts say that most of the people who can be vaccinated need to be vaccinated. But half of Americans now say they wouldn't take a vaccine if it was released now. If the Trump administration approves a vaccine before or after the election, should Americans take it and would you take it? If the public health professionals, if Dr. Fauci, if the doctors... Tell us that we should take it. I'll be the first in line to take it. Absolutely. But if Donald Trump tells us I should ta- that we should take it, I'm not taking it. Uh, well, Fauci's a professional doctor, medical healthcare practitioner, and Donald Trump plays golf. So I think that's what she's getting at. Uh, what if they both tell you to take it? Oh, I don't know. Which it's they will. It'll be like um, in the film with the spinning thing that doesn't stop spinning. Do you think it? <coughs> <coughs> Do you think that statement help helps the cause of combating vaccine hesitancy? Uh, well, <coughs> I don't really know what vaccine hesitancy is. I guess it's people are hesitant to take the vaccine. What did you say? Thirty percent of Americans. 50. 50% of Americans polled. Mm. I don't know. I was quite shocked, actually. Maybe it's just me. I thought that the fact that she said she wouldn't take a vaccine because the pre- because the president recommended it. No. Yeah, but we know why she said that, though, don't we? Why? So it's, it's, she's politicking, isn't she? She can't be saying that she would do something that Donald Trump says. She's politicking at the risk, at the expense of thousands and thousands of lives who, who yes. might not take a vaccine. Really? Well, of course she oh. was going to do that. Oh, dear. That's not a very nice thing to do, is it? She's climbing the greasy pole, isn't she, of power? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Who's pole? A, I said a greasy pole. Oh, not- sorry. Someone's greasy pole. All right. Well, moving on then. We had uh, uh, quite a big development this week. The Great Barrington Declaration. Mm. We heard about this? Uh, no, please. Enlighten. 
a bunch of, of scientists have got together. The three most prominent are Sunetra Gupta, Dr. Martin Kuldorf, Dr. Sunetra Gupta, Dr. Martin Kuldorf, and Dr. Yayanta Bhattacharya. So that... <laughs> So you have it's there. Nice. It's nice that you made an effort there with the last one. That's uh, oh, that's incredibly. Dr. That's a hundred percent accurate. I'm afraid. Oh, what? Doctor Patachaya. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got the Oxford, Harvard, and Stanford all represented. I believe Doctor Nick Riviera has signed it a few hundred <laughs> times as well. Well, this is what's interesting. You see, all the mainstream media, media outlets are piling on. The, the crux of the of the thing is the the declaration is that the lockdowns are going to end up killing more people than the virus, and we need to rethink our strategy when it comes to lockdown. And that instead of locking down healthy people, which has never been done in an epidemic before, we need to target all those resources, at trying to secure the vulnerable people, and then let the virus spread normally like it has in Sweden, and hopefully obtain herd immunity with the least amount of harm that's the that's the bottom line but yeah everyone's jumped on them oh they've had uh, they've had a uh, homeopath signing it <laughs> oh they've had people with fake names signing it i uh, the last time i looked i think there was something like ten thousand scientists i think twenty thousand med- medical practitioners and three hundred thousand general public i think have signed it I think they're linking it to a thing, a similar thing that happened with climate change denial, um, which is unfortunate um, that it's being linked with that because uh, I don't know. I, I'm not going to say anything against the Barrington Declaration because it, it makes a kind of sense. Um, but I think, unfortunately, the way it's been presented and the way it's been linked to there was climate change one and there was one about something else and probably they were throwing Brexit in there or some shit. I saw an article. You're right, they've, they've, um, they've pounced on it, the, the media. And, yeah, and kind because of it shreds a little bit. COVID is like a red, it's, it's just a constant. It's like a, a fucking, oh, what's the word? Brexit. Cash cow. <laughs> Cash cow. It's, yeah. It's the gift that keeps on giving, isn't it? Basically. Cause you know, uh, how much? Um, I wonder how much more traffic they're getting <laughs> because of it. Or well, it's probably tailed off a lot now, isn't it? It's the same with an election, a US election. It's a bonanza. When there's a US <laughs> election, there's a bonanza because of the amount of money that they get from ad revenue. Yeah, column inches. Yeah. So yeah, we don't want to. We don't want to spoil that for them, do we? Anyway, um, I've got a clip because our favourite doctor. <laughs> No, Dr. Jayanta Bhattacharya <laughs> was, on, <laughs> was on talk radio this week. And I've got a clip. I think you might find it interesting, illuminating. I think it was, it was fear driven by uh, the unknown. Um, we're no longer in that state. We know, for instance, that there's a thousand fold difference in the mortality risk. Young people face very little risk from the infection should they get, should they get infected. Um, they face much greater risk from the lockdown. Uh, people who uh, uh, who fear COVID more than cancer don't get chemotherapy. We have had uh, in the United States one in four young adults seriously considered suicide in June. Uh, one in four. Um, the uh, the uh, the people have stayed home instead of getting treatment from heart attacks because of fear of COVID strokes. Um, worldwide, we're seeing 130 million additional people who are at risk of starvation as a result of COVID. One and a half million additional cases of tuber- tuberculosis. Uh, the, the rise again in malaria, a, a cancellation of vaccine campaigns. It is the damage is catastrophic now, and it's not it's not subtle. Uh, there is more harm from the lockdown than from COVID. And of course, this is before we get to an even larger potential number in relation to a future death toll, which is that if you damage national economies, you create poverty, and it is well documented that poverty kills. Yeah, I mean, I think we've lifted one billion people out of poverty in the last 20 years because of rising GDP. Um, we uh, we basically are going to reverse a lot of that and, and with catastrophic damage. It's not just money. That money saves lives. It extends lives. It's It buys health. Um, so I think 
uh, in the early days, there was this false dichotomy between, well, we could we can just hunker down for a little while at, at some cost to, to economy, and then we'll we'll be fine. I think that was a mistake. We we forgot that this these dollars are not just simply dollars; they're they're lives. We've talked um, sort of locally in this country about some of the negative consequences, like we've seen with cancer screening and and strokes and whatnot. But I'd not heard that before. The way it brings it out to sort of a worldwide picture. 130 million people at risk of starvation. 130 million. Because of the economic damage. And he goes on about vaccine programs being cancelled. TB's on the rise. You know, no one saw any of this coming. It's like what we said at the, right at the beginning, wasn't it? We said, like, it would be interesting to see, or uh, one of us, it might be me, to see what the unintended consequences would be. Of it. Yeah. It's interesting that there's sort of an opposite. I mean, it sort of in our country, there's no. I'm, I'm a bit disappointed in the Labour Party. Their job is to scrutinise the government and the government's policy is lockdowns and local lockdowns. Mm. And Labour seem to just be going along with it. And just e- sort of criticising test and trace at the side. Yeah. <laughs> there's no real against the policy there's no real real attack on it is there because i think the with things like this they quite often get a cross-party agreement don't they so they told a line on it and they agreed to sort of criticize other things yeah but i can see that i can see the idea sort of if you think well it's a national emergency that we need political think, unity maybe yeah and that's the whole sort of premise you know like um in the, in the second world war wasn't a similar sort of thing basically they did stop elections didn't they and i think the thing is you've got to we're several months what are we nearly eight months in now we know a lot more than we did in march no yeah 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 i uh, agree with that definitely there has to be a, i think there has to be some serious scrutiny of this lockdown policy i think the the ongoing thing is isn't it that now that they want if it goes back to the health service and wanting them to keep everything else running at the same time and if hospitalizations go up again and things fall over or whatever but we're nowhere near man it's it, it's it, at the moment, if you look yeah. at well if you look at the case numbers and the people in Tezuka it ended in May it stopped mm-hmm. and it's sort of cr- cr- climbing up um, it's the 11th by Tuesday we should be having 50,000 cases a day According to that fucking graph that Witty and Valance dropped on us in September. Do you remember it? I do, yes. It's going to yes. double every seven days. Yeah. And we'll have 50,000 by mid October, the 13th of October, Tuesday. It's not going to happen. Have. Uh, that was the only scenario they presented. Let's see. All oh, right. Well, I, I'm sure I read it as it was. They could have. We could have. Yeah. But the point is, that's the only scenario they presented. They didn't say, here are three scenarios. Best case, worst case, yeah. and middle. They said this is a potential scenario, and it's the only <laughs> one we're going to show you. It was the worst case scenario, wasn't it? Ex- it was fear mongering. Same as what the other one was. It was we aren't taking this. You aren't taking this seriously enough. Get frightened <laughs> again. Get afraid. That's exactly <laughs> yeah. what it was. Yeah, it's not scientific. Mm-hmm. They need to start treating us like fucking adults. Otherwise, people will just take it into their own hands. There's well, only yeah. so much people will take. Well, do you not think that's happening at the moment? Maybe. But not in the main. No. I think, you know, there's been... As I was thinking about it today, I went to the park with my son. And, like, the park's full of kids. Um, like, heaving. So it was a quality park we went to. Mm. Um, and I suppose what are the chances of him picking up something, you know, from that? There must have been a few hundred, a couple hundred people there. I think if you're outside, if you're not much chance of picking it up. Mm. I'm just thinking, you know, it's just inevitable, isn't it? Yeah, it's inevitable. Know. Yeah. But we're just okay. delaying the agony, I think. <laughs> and delaying the agony costs lives as well. Yeah. It's not a zero sum game. 
Mm-hmm. Path of least harm we need. And we need people mm-hmm. to be criticising. We don't need the, all the mainstream newspapers jumping on these, these guys because they're going against the narrative. That doesn't help anyone. So what do you think is the, uh, the reason why they won't change tack now? They're stuck <laughs> now. The government's fucked. They're stuck. They can't. They can't roll back, can they? Because they'll look weak or something. Well, they have to admit that they've fucked it all up. Yeah, that's what I mean. Do you remember before we went in lockdown? Every other country was going into lockdown, apart from us and Sweden. And it was just political pressure from all over Mm. Europe. And we're Mm. hanging out. Mm. We're holding out and we're holding out. And then eventually we, we caved and we locked down. And I think the evidence will show that we, if we had a stronger government, maybe that, you know, it's speculation. It might be years bef- before before we find out, but I think mm. we, there's a risk that we'll find that the Swedes got it right and we fucked up. But they'll do everything they can to try and cover that up, won't they? <laughs> yeah. There was uh, another development this week on a related topic. Um, the Spectator has their own YouTube channel. Right. And um, Andrew Neil had on the um, World Health Organization Special Envoy. Uh, For the UK. It's just a special envoy. David Nabarro. He is British. All right. But, um, he was talking about lockdowns and lockdown policies. Uh, we in the World Health Organization do not advocate lockdowns as a primary means of control of this virus. The only time we believe a lockdown is justified is to buy you time to reorganise, regroup, rebalance your resources, protect your health workers who are exhausted. But by and large, we'd rather not do it. Just look at what's happened to the tourism industry, for example, in the Caribbean or in the Pacific, because people aren't taking their holidays. Look what's happened to smallholder farmers all over the world because their markets have got dented. Look what's happening to poverty levels. It seems that we may well have a doubling of world poverty by next year. We may well have at least a doubling of child malnutrition because children are not getting meals at school and their parents in poor families are not able to afford it. This is a terrible, ghastly global uh, catastrophe, actually. And so we really do appeal to all world leaders, stop using lockdown as your primary control method, develop better systems for doing it, work together together, and learn from each other. But remember, lockdowns just have one consequence that you must never, ever uh, belittle, and that is making poor people an awful lot poorer. So he said we then, didn't he? We at the WHO. Yeah, he he works for the WHO. Well, no, yeah, but uh, he's Um, not just a rogue WHO guy. Fuck, he's, you know, the current um, guy, Ted Ross, Dr. Ted Ross, who isn't a medical doctor? Nope. <laughs> He's the head of the WHO. All right. He was elected, I think, in 2017 or 2018. This guy was second. It got between Ted Ross and this guy to be head of WHO. Right, okay. So, I mean, he's... He's no mug. No, <laughs> it's But, I mean, he's pretty categorical in his language, isn't he? The, yes. It's, so... it's a last resort to buy time on a short-term mm. basis, to reorganise, redistribute, stop your, your health care system from being overrun. Mm. It's not what's something the you benefits, do. What's the benefits for lockdown or that type of control if there was no COVID for a any government? What do you mean? So if there was no COVID and a, and a rogue government, because it would have to be a rogue government to, to impose a, a random lockdown on its citizens, what what fringe benefits are there for these sorts of, of lockdowns? Outside of the the uh, narrative that it's driving the... Are we still flattening the curve? I don't know. I think we stopped. But whatever it is this week, whatever slogan... Um, it's a test. It's like a compliance test, isn't it? You could argue. Yeah. I mean, lockdowns weren't even on the SAGE committee's radar until they saw it happen in Italy. It wasn't an option for this country. The British people won't have it. And then once they saw it was possible in Western Europe, it suddenly became a policy option. The Chinese showed us how to do it. 
<laughs> now and then they got the Twitter bots over in Italy yeah. showing people. Do you remember those those videos of people collapsing in the street from from China? Do you remember seeing them? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've seen some people. Yeah, all over social media, me. people in China. Oh, collapsing dead of COVID in the street. Get out of here. Go and look it up. It's there. Well, and that's a uh, all I over. Know. No, they, they targeted it at Italy. People in Italy would see these posts, and who what well, and who was behind that? China, China, <clears throat> and that. Do you think why? Why? That's a million dollar question, isn't it? China only has fifteen active reported cases as of this morning. Yeah, <clears throat> didn't kill many people in China, did it? Eighty. Uh, sorry, only had eighty thousand cases. Yeah, so it was all China, and it was like skyrocketing and then suddenly stopped you went and mm, no very we don't strange. want this anymore very strange and we're wild people in the houses <laughs> there, was, there was some melting <laughs> yeah but they well, are we don't know what tier three is yet we'll find out tomorrow maybe it is welding oh, God. can't weld you pvc though yeah it's looking like most hospitality is going to shut tomorrow in the northwest and north of england or not, it's going to announce that it's going to be shut. No leaving your area. No socialising or mixing between households. Let's like in a bubble. <laughs> well, we don't know. Grass shooting. We don't know. We don't know what the detail will be. Bo- Bojo the clown's making a speech tomorrow. Oh, fuck off. So, they're all bowling. It. There's like thousands of them bowling yesterday. Across the road. <laughs> thousands. Oh, yeah. like, cra- crown green. Yeah, like maybe a hundred. <laughs> to be fair, it's one of the easiest sports to do socially distanced. Ground green bowling. Mm, not when you got like a hundred people on the <laughs> fucking bowling green. Yeah, if you have to handle anyone else's balls as well, you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, to be fair, they have bought a gazebo, and um, people stand under that. But in fact, I think that's having the opposite effect now. Yeah. <laughs> Created a pseudo indoor space. Um, but it has no sides, so it's just got a roof. So I don't know if that class, if, that, if that's classed as a indoor space. Can't wait to see the headline of the Crown Green Bowling Super Spreading event. <laughs> oh, like the um, inauguration of the, what is it called? Supreme Court Judge Super Spreading event at the White House. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about it last week, didn't we? And uh, Trump gave everyone the Rona. <laughs> Going back yeah. to what he's you were talking about. Now. He's, he's shouting about being immune. He no longer has it, and he's immune. He it it looked pretty rough when he took that fucking mask off. To be fair, he's looked stood rough on, for years. He's on the balcony going... <laughs> <laughs> Do you not see that? Yes, yes. He just had to climb four steps, so, but, <laughs> you, you know, come on. Is he 74? At least. Hmm. Ben, you were talking about what motivations governments might have to uh, impose lockdowns. Yeah. I have a clip from... Fringe benefits. a clip from our Antipodean friends. Uh, the New South Wales Health Minister, Brad Hazard. Good. Brad Hazard, which is a good yeah, name. That's a great name. <laughs> It'd be and a bit if of... he was called Rad Hazard. <laughs> 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 He had a bit of a Freudian slip this week. Oh, no. I'd also say this, the other area of uh, danger uh, is the place that we would normally consider to be the safest place on earth, our homes. Uh, you've already heard today that uh, one of, uh, or a number of the people who've actually uh, uh, now got the virus got it in a home situation. And we'll hear more detail about that in due course. But it is uh, both a safe place and a dangerous place. We must treat this uh, new world order New, this new world of COVID, we must treat this new world of COVID, even in our own homes, with a high level of care and caution. Oops. No, well, that, that's me triggered. <laughs> you should have, seen, should have seen woman behind him at press, press conference. She nearly had kittens. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> Cats out of the bag. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, I mean, what we're going to, that's the end of the COVID, COVID news. What are we oh. going to talk about once the US election's over and the COVID goes away? Uh, Donald Trump's Yay. second 
Jane, Jane Fonda was on some shitty podcast, I think, talking about um, COVID. Right. Was it Joe Rogan? I just think um, COVID is God's gift to the left. <laughs> Yeah, this, this, this is a terrible thing to say. I mean, I think yep. it was a very difficult thing to send down to us, but it has ripped the band-aid off who he is and what he stands for and what is being done to average people and working people in this country. We can see it now. People who couldn't see it before, you know, they see it now and we have a chance to harness that anger. And make a difference. So I just, I feel so blessed to be alive right now. Gift from oh, God. Really? Gift from God for the left. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I have a, a quick addendum from last week. You know, we talked mm. about um, Joe Biden was on the debates and he was talking about maybe getting psychologists or psychiatrists to go with the yeah. police. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. Um, you two were of the impression that it was to talk the police down. Yeah. That's the way it sounded, what, what, what he said. Well, yeah, to stop the police from getting a bit, you know, yeah. mealy. Yeah, I've got a, I've got an addendum. This came out this week from Austin, Austin, Texas, and it's about... Oh, I hate that guy. <laughs> talking down the the people. It's, a, it's like a mental health first responders. Anyway, here it is. I'm Sydney Benter. Mental health funding in Austin got a boost today. City Council voted to allocate more than $4 million to two different programs. The bulk of the funding, roughly $4 million, will help pay for an expanded mobile crisis outreach team. That team will be made up of first responders who try to get to people experiencing a mental health crisis within 10 to 15 minutes. Its goal is to avoid jail bookings and admissions to emergency rooms and to provide short-term resources to help stabilize people in need. The new funding will increase staffing to ensure 24-7 access and also pay for 500 tablet devices to first responders. Austin City Council Member Greg Kassar says the hope is that 85 to 90 percent of these calls will no longer need a police officer to respond. The really important goal here is that we'll be able to uh, respond to well over 5,000 calls uh, away from you know, traditional 911 response and to uh, trained mental health first responders. Another. There you go. Ah. You get your tablet, get your iPad, and instead of ringing 911, they send you out instead to go to this domestic di- uh, dispute. Siri, wonder, help! <laughs> yeah, I wonder how that's going to no. end in a heavily armed society. This is Austin, um, Texas. Are they bulletproof, these uh, tablets today? <laughs> I, I think they, w- they will be differentiating, won't they, between... I think what it will be is a lot of people will call 911 when they're feeling suicidal. That's it. So right. similar things exist here, where the police... Um, at, at, some kind of doctor or a paramedic and uh, a, some kind of therapist go out and see people to stop them from constantly ringing 999, basically. Even if they're at the uh, r- risking the general public? Yes, because it's, it's difficult. I mean, it, it, in so, it, what do you mean if they were going to sort of kill themselves by throwing themselves in front of a, a car or a train? For example. Um, that's quite a hard thing to sort of a judge because some people would just say they're going to do that, but you've got to make a judgment call as to whether or not they're actually going to do it or they're just saying it, and it's difficult, really. It'd be interesting to see how it goes. Yeah. It's this um, idea of reallocating funds, isn't it? Do you fund, yes, do you fund the police and send it into programmes like this? I think the thing is, is with this is, it, although it's reactive, potentially it's preventative in the longer run. If someone has access to a, a mental health practitioner, there's a thing run at, um, it was on the news recently at Blackpool um, A&E, because basically something stupid, I don't know if this is probably wrong, but something like 80% of the traffic through um, uh, A&E was um, caused by, say, um, 20 people or 100 people in a population of like 100,000 or whatever. 
Um, so they went out to these people and actually did targeted work with them. All these people that were repeatedly going through A and E. Right. Some of it was mental health. Some of it was like chronic stuff. But um, yeah. And that's it's not quite the same. This is an emergency. You, no, yeah. We're going to be yeah. there within 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. That's where I'm, you know, I'm all for intervention, early intervention. But this, I'm not sure. I'm skeptical. <laughs> no, yeah. And I think that it depends, doesn't it, on what what they mean by the calls. If it is like what you said in someone's, if they're kind of just saying, oh, this person sounds a bit crazy, we'll send someone out with an iPad. Or if it is, you know, someone is bringing up because of the feel of the suicide, or then there's a difference, isn't there? I suppose. Yeah, yeah. What's the risk? What what are the risk factors involved? Yeah, it'd be very difficult. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it pans out. It's it's happening. So yeah, I'll follow it. But um, we yeah, we hinted at it before, but there's there's only been one huge story in the US this week. <laughs> The team and I agree that all our evaluations, and most importantly, his clinical status, support the president's safe return home. Now, I think you've seen the videos uh, and now the tweets. And just- Orange Man yeah. is back. Yeah, he is. God, nice. God bless. <laughs> He's got superhuman powers as well. Uh-huh. This, uh, it's immune to the vid. Did you, did you see the um, video we put together? The promo video. <laughs> it was awful, wasn't it? He <laughs> uh, uh, sounded like Andrew Sat- 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 <laughs> it Oh man, yeah, he give it the, the. He's good at the the blit, uh, the glitz and the glamour, isn't he? And uh, yeah. PR. Yeah, but. There's a lot of people who th- who are going down the conspiracy angle on this, you know. That he was he never, never had it. He never had it. Yeah, never had it. people, people on the that. left mm. were saying this is a ploy. He never had it. But how do you account for all those other people in his camp in his in the White House who tested <laughs> yeah. positive? You see. Well, um, then this. Uh, then well, they you say can, you can easily had, fake a positive test, can't you? Yeah, yeah. just Come take on. a PCR test. <laughs> so, well, you've got it. Yeah, you've got it. You'll have to isolate. Oh, you're lucky. It's been mild. You've had no symptoms. <laughs> yeah. Do you know the thing is, people are skeptical because he's made a recovery. Look at the stats. Most people, even old people, get it mild. You know, it's it's only a maybe five percent of really old people who get hospitalised by it. And he's had the best care available to mankind. I spoke to someone today whose mum was something like eighty-eight. She had terminal cancer dementia and had covid and was fine like cured yeah. everything yeah could have been a false positive though you see we know how shit the pcr test is yes you know what i would like to know how many people die have died say in this country how many people have died <laughs> with it with no core morbidities yeah not not a mm-hmm. huge amount it's been around that you always hear like they've been I don't know, 100 deaths, and all of them apart from two had comorbidities. Mm. So, I mean, that's 2%, clearly. But, you know, it's low numbers. And Mm. some of those may have had undiagnosed comorbidities, morbidities. Like what? Well, I don't know, heart disorder or or anything. Right. Type 1 diabetes. Uh, And they didn't pick that up in the hospital? You wouldn't necessarily live for it if someone's if someone's got COVID and they, you know that's what you're going to treat because it's causing them the most issues and then they die and then they say well clinically you didn't didn't really have anything well, they're not going to do an autopsy yeah. on everything on everyone who dies of uh, dies with COVID mm. COVID crows and it's <laughs> with isn't it yeah died with yeah. Within well, it's died within twenty eight days of a positive test, so you don't even have to have it. You can have yeah, had it and got over cause. it. Yeah, died of any cause. Yeah, any mm-hmm. cause. Yeah, you can still die of a car crash, but if you've tested positive three weeks ago, you, you're a COVID death. Which makes no sense, and that should be something easy to filter out. What if you were coughing and then die? You drove the car into a tree. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, could happen. Well, it's like, how do you determine cause of death in that? If, you, if you're a paramedic, you got to the scene and said, right, oh, we drove into a tree and died. 
And then you got to hospital and said, oh, hang on, he had COVID. So get him on the list. Exactly, yeah. In this case, it's a mail driver. <laughs> Public Health England, um, you know, they release the COVID-19 surveillance statistics every, I don't know, is it every week or every month? I can't remember. But um, the last round of surveillance statistics came out on the 8th. And in the surveillance uh, blurb, they announced that from now on, they will be uh, releasing COVID and influenza combined, rather than just COVID on its own. It's comorbidity. So we'll Why? Why? Yeah. Boost yeah. those figures a little. So it's not a comparison. They're putting them together. We're waiting to see. It just says combined. So will that be two graphs on the on the thing? I hope they're not putting them under the same thing. Why not? Oh, why no, they? Just, because then they're just going to boost the figures, aren't they? Yeah. It's just silly. We'll see. We'll see what happens when the next surveillance data comes out. Which yeah. takes me back to what are the fringe benefits of causing panic in your population? What do you think they are, Ben? I, I, I think panic people are, are easier to control as perverse as that sounds. Well, because no, we're not all running the streets, screaming and smashing things up. And nobody's burning down those um, 5G towers oh, anymore. Of course, yeah. No one's, <laughs> no one's worried about Brexit and whether we're going to get a yeah. deal or not. I've, I've, yeah, everyone's, everyone's giving up with that. Really it, That's yeah. gone well on the back burner, hasn't it? Mm. Good luck finding that in the newspaper. Exactly. Brexit, yeah. I'd be I'd be very interested to see what the COVID levels look like early next year, as soon as Brexit is, is finished and there's nothing anyone can do about it. And Trump's in again. Yeah. Well, Have you heard they're uh, panicking? They're trying to pander to Joe Biden's lot just in case. Now there's a bit of a bit yeah. of umming and ahhing over whether uh, who's going to get re-elected, and they want to hedge the bets a little. Well, it's massively down in the polls, Orange Man. Orange man, just remember the tango. <laughs> hmm? Every time you say orange man, I think of the tango advert. Oh, Matt was saying something. Oh, right, sorry. I wasn't. I just went. <laughs> <laughs> I drink, and I know things. <laughs> you drink, and you mishear things. <laughs> oh dear. Um, have we got anything to add? We, what time are we on? Uh, 10 o'clock. Oh, well, that's, yeah. that's timed out pretty well, isn't it? Why is it? Right. Are, we, are we quite are we, good at timing of like, how are we doing? You know, in the last six months? I don't want to, you, you two end up falling asleep if I go on much longer. Get out, I've not even <laughs> fiddled with anything. All I've, to, all I've done is I've pulled up a, a little piece of uh, post-it note. That's it. Why, what else is there? I'm in recovery. Not... My desk is littered with nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 20, 20 more clips. I've got no. a harmonica. There's a an unused Chromecast. Stop it, Ben. You're just talking nonsense now. I um I need to make an apology actually. Oh, again. <sighs> again, yeah. Forever apologizing. But I'm apologizing on behalf of last week's guest. Comatan. You know I mean usually oh. like George Van Ralt tonight. So nice, so polite. Um, all our guests have been so polite, but I don't know what got into Comatan last week, but just check this out. And really that was the beginning of it, because that, that was the first thing I came across, was this this myth of the cosmic hunt. And, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the cosmic hunt and the cosmic hunt. And... It's not neat for it, is it? That's, that's, that's just... What? Awful. <laughs> oh, have you anything to add? Should we go? Yeah. yeah if you, if you, well, if you push us out the door, yeah, we'll go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Give me a goose, you big communist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Who's on next week? Uh, Darren. Uh, next week? Oh, it's your, um, it's your dream boats are coming on. Darren and Graham from, oh, Gra from, from Gry America next week. Yeah. Me and I with the Gry Americans. We're going to go over my, my 
compound synchronicity that I sent them. 1177 BC. Oh, nice. Yeah. And it really bothers me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I don't know. Okay, good stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. See you guys later. Conda forever. Conda forever. Uh, 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 because I, I believe I, I have an issue in this respect. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I've been coming to terms with the fact that I'm I, a Marxist. A I'm yes, literally yes. a communist. Yes, yes, it's funny bickering. Who the fuck's that? Yeah, me. Come here, goose, you big communist. <laughs> Cut out. Cunt. Great. I got Harry. Cunt! Because I'm literally a. I've been coming to terms with the fact that I'm a Marxist. Because I'm literally a communist. The cosmic cunt. They give him a big fat shot in the ass and...